Last week, we concluded our study of the book of Ezekiel. And we took a fairly detailed look at the prophetic aspect of things in Ezekiel. One of the commonalities with the books we'll begin studying this time, moving to the New Testament, we are going to begin to study God's history book of the New Testament, which is the book of Acts. As we look at the Old Testament and we see First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, we see the Old Testament history as it unfolds from God's perspective and from the perspective of the Israelites in the two separate sections. We'll now see a historical overview of things concerning the apostles, the acts of the apostles, the things that they did, their actions, as related from the perspective of someone who had unique training. The book of Acts could have equally been and more and legitimately named Second Luke. It was written by Luke. And as we'll find in the first verse, he makes reference to his original letter, the book of Luke, and makes it clear that this is a continuation of the events that culminated in the resurrection of Jesus. Luke is an interesting character in that Luke is unlike the others that are involved in the church to this point. Luke is half Gentile. Having a mother who was a Jew and having a father who was a Gentile. Luke was a physician. And as it existed in that day, was familiar with some semblance of the empirical process. In other words, he had training in analysis. And he was able to hear various things from a scenario and to draw a conclusion or diagnoses based on the elements he heard about, signs and symptoms, as we call it today. One of the things that is unclear but very likely is that Luke was not a free man. Most physicians in the day were slaves. Luke addresses this letter in a very particular way, which also has various interpretations with various Bible commentators. Let's begin with Acts, the first chapter. In the first verse. The former treatise I have made, he's talking about the book of Luke that he wrote in the Synoptic Gospels. O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, he addresses this letter to Theophilus. Theophilus is Greek for lover of God. There are those that believe that Luke, being a slave, had gotten saved. And when he had gotten saved, his master also was a believer. And that his master, after having met Paul in his missionary journeys, allowed Luke the ability to travel with Paul. And it was common in those days and in circumstances like that 
for the slave, the bondman, to write letters back to their master. And if this is indeed the case and Theophilus is an individual who is his master, he is communicating with a fellow believer that would have interest in all the things concerning what Jesus was doing in the church. The second interpretation is that Theophilus is an individual who was a friend, who just had a very wonderful name, lover of God. And then the third, that this wasn't an individual at all, that Luke's intent in using this term was to say this letter is being listened, or being written for all the lovers of God. Now, the most likely of those scenarios in the opinion of most, and I agree, is that Luke was indeed, as was the custom of the day, a slave, and that he was writing back to a Christian owner. And because they were Christians, that you couldn't tell who was the slave and who was the master. They were believers together. And his friend and master rejoiced in knowing the progress of the church and rejoiced in hearing the tales of the workings of God through the Holy Spirit in his servant and friend, Luke. Notice he says, the former treatise I have made, Book of Luke, O Theophilus, and all that Jesus began to do and teach. In his former book, he describes the life of Jesus and the teachings that he gave in various points. Until the day that he was taken up and he ended the book of Luke with the story of his ascension on the Mount of Olives. After that, uh, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, what he is saying here is that Jesus had a ministry for three years in the earth, and he recorded those things. But the ministry of Jesus did not stop with his death. It continued after his revelation, after his ascension, his, menu, his ministry, continues today. Jesus spoke to the disciples and he gave them instructions about what they were supposed to do. And we'll find that those instructions included instructions to go to a certain place and to wait until what? Until they were endued with power from on high. If you have a King James. Jesus is still in the business of giving direction to his disciples today. The ministry of Jesus has never stopped. He's at the right hand of the Father making intercession. And he gives direction now to men and women who will hear him. Why? So that they might accomplish his mission in their lives. Now, why do I go through all that? It's really significant and important to appreciate. Number one, that this book, that this revelation is to a church that is virtually 100% Jewish. There are virtually no Gentiles at this point. And that's very significant as we go through and we look at the first and second chapter. Number two, the book is not written to the church. There is no church at this point. There are a group of apostles who have been with Jesus, men that have been with him. There's no structure, there's no organization, there's nothing. There's no indication of anything in a formal structure. What there are are individuals that Jesus is speaking to, to take action. Now friends, that is extremely significant as we see what he does when he finally does set the church in place. He continues to speak to individuals in that circumstance. 
Keep that in mind because he's speaking to us today. Not as a corporate body so much as he's speaking to us as individuals through the vehicle of the Holy Spirit inspiring this book. Amen? So in short, there's a message to you today. He goes on. Second verse again, until the day in which he was taken up after the he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments to his apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, when he speaks of many infallible proofs, showing himself, the scripture records 10 individual circumstances in which Jesus appeared to up to 500 people at a time. There was nothing hidden in this. Jesus bodily showed himself to Thomas. He said, put your, fin put your fingers in the holes in my hand. Thrust your hand into my side where you know they put a spear. It's me. As he spoke to them as he was standing by the fire and he had been cooking fish for them. When they saw him, Peter jumps off the boat and swims to shore because Jesus is on the shore. He's been resurrected. Jesus says, got anything to eat? He says, ghosts don't eat. I'm not a ghost. I'm a person. Jesus is alive and well today in a body just like, well, it's not just like ours. Ours is flawed. Some of our bodies don't have hair. Some of our bodies are overweight. But when we get the new one, it's going to be just like Jesus and it's going to be slick. It's going to be really good. New model. Yeah. And it'll all have hair. I'm thinking of a pompadour, you know, something like that. It's going to be way cool. But Jesus is alive and well today. And when he tells them this, he is making the case. He is making the case that Jesus is still very much in control of believers who are truly born again and who will listen to him. That he is directing the events and paths for people who choose to follow that. Jesus didn't simply wind, create the universe, wind it up, show up for three years, and then take off, and now he's just sitting back and watching everything happen until he finally decides to come back, judge a bunch of people, and put them in a lake of fire. That's not what's happening. Jesus is working. Jesus is intervening. Jesus is available. He's answering prayer. He's directing people's lives. Matter of fact, I would venture to say, and there are commentators that I think agree with me, the ministry of Jesus since his resurrection has had a greater, greater impact on the Christian church than his three-year ministry when he was here. Not that it was insignificant. It was extremely significant. But he has interacted more done more since his ascension than he did in the three years that he was physically on the earth in a small geographic area. So we have, in our concept of God, it's important for us to appreciate we are interacting with a thinking, breathing, corporeal, existent Jesus. When we get to heaven, you'll be able to recognize Jesus, though none of us have ever seen him before. He will be the only one with wounds. Our bodies will be perfect. His will have wounds in its hands and wounds in his side. And everybody will have the chance to see that. In kind of a sort of a way, Jesus will be the only handicapped person in heaven. I could go on with that for a long time. So many infallible proofs. Ten recorded appearances after his resurrection. Proof of the resurrection. 
Now, this is significant. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, which uh, saith he, you have heard of me. How many here believe that there is a country called China? Mm -hmm. Now, more important, how many here believe it exists? Mm -hmm. How many here have been to China? Why in the world would you believe something you've never seen yourself? Why would you do that? How many here believe there was a, a historical figure called George Washington? Mm -hmm. How many believe that he crossed the Delaware? Mm -hmm. How many believe that uh, he was uh, the leader of a group that defeated the Hessians and surprised everybody? If you knew your history, you'd know that. Mm -hmm. That's the absolute truth. How many know he was a British officer? Yeah, George Washington. He was a commander of the colonial, colonial British uh, force prior to, you need to study your history. <laughs> Why do you believe that? No, no, listen. It was a couple of hundred years ago. It's ancient history. Why would you believe something from ancient history? Why in the world did, would you believe that the United States hasn't always existed? Why in the world would you believe that there was a time before the United States existed. Why do you believe that? May I suggest to you that one of the principal reasons you believed it is because people who had credibility with you told you that to begin with. And because those people with credibility in your eyes were so matter of fact about the way they described it, as a matter of fact, there were people who wrote books about it and they made you read it. They called them teachers. <laughs> right? The point is, the reason that we believe these facts that we share in common is because we have been informed by those who claim to have information from eyewitness accounts. Eyewitness accounts. And because they were eyewitness accounts, we consider that when there's more than one or two, that they are correct. As a matter of fact, if you go to court today, if you go to court today, after having seen a bank robbery and you saw the guy clearly, and there are nine other people in the bank, and they see the same guy, and they call you to the stand and they'll say, well, uh, were you at the bank? Yes, sir. I was at the bank. And what did you see? I saw a guy take out a gun, put it in the teller's face, demand cash from the bank, and at any rate, that he took, then he took that, then he left the bank. And then what happened? And then I saw the police officer who was outside, because this guy didn't notice the patrol car, arrest this guy, and took him off to jail. And you say it, and nine other people get on a stand, and they say it, what do you think is likely to happen in court? This guy, this guy should have taken the plea deal. Yeah. It's been established. It's called the Juris Method. Now, there are those who discount what the scripture says, saying that it's not reliable. How do you know when something is reliable? I suggest to you that you can come to know what is reliable out of somebody's mouth when it costs them something to say it, when there is a consequence for not telling the truth. There were 12, 12 apostles. One of them committed suicide because he ratted Jesus out, right? Mm -hmm. All but one of those apostles, well, all of them were eyewitnesses of Jesus. They all saw him after his resurrection. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it was one of the requirements that they applied to one that they were going to vote in as a replacement for Judas. All of them saw Jesus after his resurrection. 
and all but one, John, died a horrible, excruciating death because they refused to recant their testimony that they saw Jesus after he was resurrected. It cost them something to make that assertion. You say, why? I would ask you to think about this. Does anybody tell a lie when it's going to cost them their life? You know, there's an old saying that says in psychology circles, okay, all human behavior can be summed up in one simple idea. People either do things either to get something or to avoid something. And if you can determine what they're trying to avoid or what they're trying to get, you can determine what motivates their action. It's that simple. What do you get when people say, we will kill you if you don't change your story? You get dead. It would not sound from an earthly perspective that there is a huge upside in this. The fact is, they counted the upside caring more about what God thought about what they said than what men thought, even though it cost them something. The reality is, the fact of Jesus' resurrection from the dead is absolutely historically factual. He was, and he appeared to hundreds of people over the course of 40 days and they knew it. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes the case for the resurrection. He says if the resurrection isn't true, everything you believe is in vain. Don't waste your Sunday going to church. Don't put your money in the offering box. Don't do any of that stuff because it's a fraud if the resurrection of Jesus is not true. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. He says everything, everything in the Christian experience hinges on the resurrection. Why? Because our hope in this world that's messed up, torn up, and seems to be getting worse with every passing news report, everything hangs on the fact of a future hope for you and I as Christians. And that hope begins with the sure and certain assurance that we are alive and remain, will be caught away, will be res and that those who are dead and died in Christ will be resurrected. And Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. And as the first fruits of the resurrection, he was resurrected from the dead in order to say, it's put up or shut up time. I am resurrected and so will you be. I proved it. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. Thank you very much. <laughs> Kindly turn off your devices. All right. So, now we've established that China exists. Verse 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now there is a subtle difference as we go through this in some of the ways that an event is described. And there is a definite reason. And it has to do with the significance of the Greek grammar in which it's written. And it's very important to appreciate that dis difference. There is an analogy that's made here with the baptism of John. When John baptized people, he baptized them 
into repentance as a Jew. In other words, he spoke against the way Judaism had deteriorated under the leadership of those who had deteriorated it for their own gain and, gain and political convenience. He spoke out against them. Herod executed him over it. And when he baptized people, it was an outward symbol that they now had rejected that religious system and that they recognized that they must return to scriptural Judaism. That's what he did. For John truly baptized with water. He inducted people into that change of life by water baptism. Water baptism is a ceremony. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked for him, saying, Lord, wilt thou that this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Now notice, it is an absolute promise and guarantee. Not many days hence, you're going to be baptized. That's what he says, with the Holy Ghost. You are going to be inducted into something. There is going to be an induction event. You're going to become part of something. And do you notice here that it does not say you will be given the opportunity to be baptized. This is a unilateral action on the part of Almighty God through the Holy Spirit. This isn't an optional thing. You're saved. The Holy Ghost is going to come into your life. Now, before anybody gets excited, I'm going to tell you. I started off a good Pentecostal boy. And I will tell you. Oh, I'm going to wait. Let me build a little more foundation. When they were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Now, who, remember the inductive Bible study steps. Who is speaking? Luke. Who is he speaking to? At this point, he's writing this to Theophilus, but when he's speaking about these disciples, who was speaking? Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's speaking to Jewish disciples. Jewish disciples. That's who's getting this. All right? They have asked him a question. And the question was? Yeah. Well, is this the time where you're going to restore the kingdom? What scripture did the Jews have? The Old Testament, right? That's the only thing that existed. We've been going through. We've been through Leviticus. We've been through Ezekiel. We've been through Daniel. What did they know about the future of Israel? They've been listening to the Psalms. They knew Psalms 16 by heart, and that's significant. That's what all the promises were about. The kingdom being restored. I've by, There are people in Bible commentaries that really say that these people did a bad thing. That they, they asking that question, that it was selfish of them to be asking about that. They missed the point of what's being said here. They were taking what they had been taught since they were children and they came back to Jesus and they said, is this the point at which you're gonna be king? Is this the point at which you're gonna set things straight and you're gonna restore Israel? That was the eschatology that they knew. The only error that they made in asking this question was that based on their knowledge of the scripture as it existed, they had, didn't have 
an adequate concept of the entire plan of God. They were only seeing a small piece. Now, let me suggest that there's a danger for believers today. When we get so focused on a few small pieces of scripture as proof texts, we can come to the point where we become so narrow that we do not see the whole purpose and plan of God as revealed in a 10,000 foot view over his entire scripture. And they, based on that very focused understanding of the purpose and plan of God, couldn't see us as Gentiles. They couldn't see God's plan to include us, to graft us in. They didn't have any idea. All they could see is going on. Now, you could legitimately see Jesus saying at this point, listen, and his answer really gives an indication of it. Jesus answered them, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. Now, Jesus wasn't say, it's none of your doggone business, just do what I tell you. That's not what he was saying. A better way to look at that is in this paraphrase. Look, your question is legitimate. But you're only on step two of the grand plan of God, which has one million steps. How about focusing on what I have for you right now? How about focusing on things where you're at? Wow, what implications for us? Have you ever gone to God and, you know, you've done, you've done the prayerful pleading and pleading and pleading and it seems like the heavens are brass? Like, there's no answer. Well, you know what? Sometimes because God's saying, wait. Sometimes it's because God is saying, no. But there is something else that happens. Sometimes it's because God is being silent because that is not what he wants to talk to us about. I want to, I want to talk to you about the way you treat so-and-so. And when you're ready to talk about that, the way you treat your brothers and sisters, then we'll talk about what you want to talk about. Maybe I told you not to do this and that. And my word says don't do this and that. And you decided you're going to do it anyway? Okay. Well, when you get tired of the dead air, I'd be glad to talk to you. And the amazing thing is, when we get so serious that we can't stand it anymore, and we decide, well, what the heck? I'm going to do what others did in the scripture, and I'm going to fast, and I'm going to pray, I'm going to get my focus completely and totally on God. All of a sudden, he talks to us, but it's still not about point number two. 